Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. Daniel had 163 kids. What was his presence like in your life? Mine, personally, I didn't really see him very often. He would come by twice, twice a month, unless he was mad at my mom, then he would come by once a month. He only needs to fertilize them, basically. Everyone knows that he went to jail for um, making his 16-year-old daughter marry his brother. And while he was in prison, he was able to get work release, and he, in his office, he, well, he had his ankle bracelet on, I was being beat by him. So he was, he was still beating us. Jeez. The question I get the most um, is like, oh, how does he support that many people? Oh, he doesn't. These women are single parents. You relied on dumpster diving then for your food. Yeah. Aside from what you were making at the store. Um, actually, I got pulled out of school at 14. They said that what God wanted me to do was to go get a full-time job and support the younger kids. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening on one of our podcast apps and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like the video, help boost the algorithm, subscribe, become one of our supporters, and leave words of encouragement for our guests who are coming on and bravely sharing their stories. So today, Today's guest, I was connected to him through one of your favorite guests, <laughs> Amanda Ray from the Kingston Group. He's also from the Kingston Group, which is part of a fundamentalist Mormon polygamous sect in Utah. So we're going to get all into his family, the dynamic, what it was like being gay within that group, and also some of the hardships that he faced growing up in the group. So thank you so much for joining us, Val Snow. Yeah, happy to be here. Um, and I'm wearing her merch, Amanda Ray. Oh, <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> Amanda is definitely one of our favorites. She's so funny and yeah, everyone loves her. So I'm sure we're gonna bring her back soon. She's actually coming to Los Angeles soon. So we're gonna hang out and probably record some stuff. But I was so happy that she connected us. You have a pretty amazing story of resilience and coming out the other side and really coming into who you are. And I just cannot wait to get into it. So I guess where we should start is maybe I'll, I'll try my best to give a little rundown of the Kingston group as far as the polygamous Mormon part. And then I'm going to have you jump in and talk about your family dynamic specifically. So as far as I'm aware, tiny, tiny history of Mormonism. When they said that they couldn't do polygamy anymore, they being the government, Mormonism kind of had a bunch of breakoffs and split offs for people who said no. Joseph Smith said polygamy is something that we have to do in order to get to the highest level of heaven. And so it created a whole bunch of different groups who disagreed at first, maybe, and then started breaking off into their own groups. So one of those groups is the Kingston clan, also known as they call themselves the Order. And in this group specifically, as far as I'm aware, talking to Amanda for a few episodes, they're really, really specific about keeping the bloodline pure, so they don't really want a bunch of people joining. It's very common to have incestuous relationships, and it causes a lot of problems, as you can imagine. So multiple, multiple wives, tons of children. And so now, Val, <laughs> tell us about your family dynamic. My father was John Daniel Kingston, and he has uh, 14 wives. He's the leader Paul's brother, and he's the second lowest number, and they have a, like a numbered system. And I don't, if anyone sees Amanda Ray's channel, they know about the number system. <laughs> but um, the lowest number is nine right now, and that's the, Paul, and he's the leader of the order. Mm. And my dad was his older brother. Okay, so 14 wives, and your mother was wife number seven, right? Correct. She's seven, and I'm her first son. 
I'm her actually oldest, yeah. Wow. I'm her oldest kid. And one of the numbers that also was very shocking is just how many kids your dad has through all of these 14 wives. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know of 163. After that, I lost track, like, I don't know, from there. Wow, that's a lot of kids. And so I think one of the questions that everyone's going to be thinking or asking is, how did your dad spend time with or did he even try to spend time with all of these children Ew. <laughs> sorry I, I really don't like him <laughs> i don't really call him my dad but for the oh. conversation we can okay we can what call would him you that. rather call him because <laughs> i would call i'll call him anything you want i'll call him darth vader if you want <laughs> nah, we'll just, he, he, we call him daniel we'll call him Daniel. okay daniel <laughs> got it <laughs> Which I want to say, I know off camera, you were like, I don't even really want to give this guy the time of day. So if you want to put that disclaimer out, then we can move forward. <laughs> I really don't like this guy. Any attention you give him, he's just like, he eats it up, good or bad. Like, I want to bring awareness. And it's more because I know this, the things that happened to me, it wasn't exclusive to me. Sorry, my dog is crazy. That's okay. Basically, I want to share my story with my father, John Daniel Kingston, because I know it's not exclusive to me that there was other people that are still being abused. Mm. Yeah. And we really appreciate you coming on and sharing because I know it's it's hard and I totally get it when you don't want to speak about someone who has hurt you in that way. <clears throat> and so to make it clear for the record, we are not praising him in any way. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We are calling him out bringing light to these dark situations and hoping that with other people watching, they can find healing just through even feeling validated with something that's happened to them or knowing that they're not alone. So we appreciate that. And when we speak about Daniel, that's the only reason why <laughs> is to get a fuller picture yeah. of what your life was like specifically, because I'm interested in your story and how you grew up and how that affected you. So Daniel had 163 kids. What was his presence like in your life? Mine, personally, I didn't really see him very often. He would come by twice twice a month. Unless he was mad at my mom, then he would come by once a month. And typically just because the women know their cycles. And this sounds so romantic, right? But he only needs to fertilize them, basically. Wow. Because is it part of the doctrine specifically within your group that you should have as many children as possible? Yeah, multiply and replenish the earth. And as far as my relationship with my father, we didn't really hang out a lot. Most of the time it was just like being punished or mm. abused, or disciplined, I guess. Let's say a nice way to say Well, it. he would <laughs> call it discipline. We would call it abuse, right? Right. And his way of raising kids was like, he first establishes fear. Then with fear comes respect and with respect comes love is his philosophy. Yeah, that's not very loving. It doesn't feel very loving. It feels really scary. How did you feel growing up with that type of environment? It was really scary. I actually, when he came over, luckily it was always pretty late at night. So I just be like, it's bedtime. I'm like, get out of here. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're not sticking around with this guy. Okay. So that's your relationship with your dad. And, and we'll probably bring him up a little, sorry, with Daniel. We'll probably bring him up a little bit later as well. But I'd also like to hear about your relationship with your mom. Oh, I love that girl. <laughs> She's a good lady. <laughs> that's great. That's great news. <laughs> How did she manage with all of these kids? That must have been really difficult. Oh, yeah, it was. Because in those groups, you would think that usually the question I get the most um, is like, oh, how does he support that many people? Oh, he doesn't. These women are single parents. Yeah. We connected because the only people she has friendships with is her kids, really. And so me and Chanel um, helped raise the kids. Right. And I, I meant to mention earlier that Chanel is from the Escaping Polygamy TV show. I know we have some fans here who watched that show or watched it when it was still airing. So you are her brother. <laughs> so if anyone wants to make that connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I got pulled out of school at 14 to... Uh, I was dyslexic and I wasn't like in the best grades. And so they said that I should just... Um, what God wanted me to do was 
to go get a full-time job and support the younger kids. We have this thing called the memory gyms, right? Um, here's a copy of them. <laughs> and what are those? One of the memory gems are, it is my firm resolve and fixed purpose to give my all to the Lord, my time, my talents, all that I am or ever expect to be to the, to the establishment of Zion and the building up of kingdoms God of, here on the earth. Mm. And we would say this memory gems every day, twice a day. Oh, wow. Was that just like a routine you would do morning and night? Yep, 7 a.m. and 7 at night. Okay, so it sounds like you were on a pretty strict regimen. And I mean, that's kind of the definition of high control group, right? That very first thing that you just read is I will literally give everything to this group for the purpose of raising up the kingdom of God. And there's traces of that in mainstream Mormonism, but it's not as hardcore. They, they expect a lot of you. That's definitely a thing. But it sounds like this was more extreme which obviously we know that fundamentalism is always more extreme than non-fundamentalism. But you were eight years old when you were first told to start working, right? Right. Um, my first job was just at a True Value store. I would just walk there after elementary school because that's where my mom worked. So I would just go in the back and label like new items, new shipments that came in. And were they actually paying you for this? Uh, I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. There was a lot of times. So I could have been getting like 10 cents an hour or I could have been working for free because there was many summers I worked for free the entire summer. Okay. So you actually didn't see any return from the work that you were doing? No. And you would, you only got to see your statement like once a week or once a month. So if you was being paid, you wouldn't find, or if you wasn't being paid for a job you're doing, you would find out like a month later that the whole time you wasn't even being paid for that. Wow. Yeah. I remember Amanda talking a little bit about the banking system and how you can't just go on and check your account balance at any time. And sometimes they'll just take money out and you don't know why. And so you really don't have any sort of tangible assets or money to yourself, right? Right. But nothing's yours anyways. To be fully consecrated, it all belongs to God. Everything, you, your time, your talents, anything you ever expect to be or make yeah, it belongs to God. So in a more literal sense, it belongs to the church, right? To the Kingston group. Yeah, it belongs... In a more literal sense, it actually belongs to your father because the way they do it is each family is expected to produce um, a surplus in the group. And so anything I made actually went straight to my father. Oh, wow. How interesting. Did you get any idea from your perspective as a kid or, or even now, does it seem like he was well off, your dad? Oh, yeah, it's hard not to be well off when you have 160 kids working for you. Right. And then you get the funds. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to piece together how this was legal that they were allowing an eight-year-old to work. Is the store owned by the Kingston Group, or how did that work? Yeah, all your jobs, like part of what that whole memory gem is like, they would tell you you only work for the order because everything is supposed to be within the order. Okay, so... Just to get a fuller picture, and for those who aren't familiar with our other episodes with Amanda, so within the order, you, you're not living on a compound like the FLDS, for example. You're in regular society, but you're still isolated and told where you can go and where you can work. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you are expected to just work with around outsiders, basically make money from them and bring it into the order. But you don't like, for example, if you're going to public school or if you're going to uh, have a, like a client that's an outsider, then you, you can be professional, but you never like get drinks after. You don't get too close. Can't you're be just friends polite. With them. And people ask how you're doing and you just say, good. You don't ask how they're doing. <laughs> oh, so did you have specific rules around that in the way that you could speak to outsiders? Yes, you just had to be polite, and but not overly polite. Don't invite the conversation, like I said. If they ask how you're doing, you don't ask how they're doing back. You just say good. Interesting. How did that affect you? Did you feel isolated or because you had siblings, you felt like you had some sort of social life? How did that make you feel not being able to talk to anyone aside from people in the order? I did it anyways. You did? <laughs> you rebel you. 
<laughs> before I forget, I do want to mention back on the um, money part of things. You do get a, a statement that keeps track of what's yours. Okay. And I say yours, like you can ever have it ever. <laughs> yeah. So it shows you what you have technically, but you can't actually withdraw it, right? Without permission. Yeah. And permission would come from your father. Right. Did you ever try to do that? Get permission? Yeah, all the time. Because anything you buy, all your incomings and outgoings. So that means if you find a penny, you have to put it in the order bank. And then even if you want to spend that same penny, you have to write what it's for when you take it out, even if you're just going to use it right away. Wow. So in that sense, there's no debit card or credit card. You have to physically pull the money out to use it? Yeah, they do have checks that they'll make. And I'm, I'm sure they've come a long way since I've been there, but yeah, dip, typically you go to their office and it's just their bank. You call Cardline and be like, hey, I want to add this much money on. And then they'll either, if you're approved for it, because your dad will pre-approve you for so much money each month. Okay. And then if it's not approved, then you have to get him to call them if he decides to approve it. Okay, I'm, I'm getting a, a better picture of your childhood here. So you're growing up in a home with 12 siblings or 11 siblings eventually. And you're with your mom. You rarely see your dad. You're working as an eight-year-old basically for free. You don't have access to your own assets without permission. And your dad, when he does come around, Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> when he does come around, you can call him that. <laughs> just Honestly, like autopilot. It what sorry. We call him. Um, just call him that. It's if easier. it comes out, it comes out. But I'm going to try to say Daniel. I'm going to really try. No, it's fine. So when Daniel comes around, he's not kind and he's abusive to you. And that just must have been really difficult to grow up with. And is there anything specific that you'd like to speak on and things that you wanted to bring light to? So many things. Okay. <laughs> I hate that this video is probably going to include. Basically, it's about him. <laughs> oh, no. We're going to move on quickly, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, it's just, I don't know how we can talk about it without, you know, bringing him, including into him it. in the story. Everyone knows that he went to jail for um, making his 16-year-old daughter marry his brother. And he abused her. So he basically got her, went to prison for... Abuse. Okay. Abusing her. And while he was in prison, he was able to get work release. And he, in his office, he while he had his ankle bracelet on, I was being beat by him. So he was he was still beating us. Jeez. And I, I know I smile and it's just whatever. But that's just how... I mean, it's been 20 some odd years. I'm, I'm moving on. And this is how I move on. Yeah. Everyone has their process. And then let's see what else. Beyond the physical abuse, there was sexual abuse from my father. And the crazy part was, I don't know, like, to this day that he was actually, like, finding pleasure in the sexual side of it. He enjoys seeing someone in pain. Mm -hmm. Chanel calls him a sadist. Mm -hmm. And so I was working at the cattle ranch um, in Washakie. And... I, we were going on a, a drive. He was going to teach me how to drive. And whenever he's nice, that's when you know you're in trouble mm. or like something bad's going to happen when he's nice. And so we, we went on a truck drive and he was going to teach me how to drive a truck. And it ended up being where I, I get molested and then beat afterwards when I have no idea what's even going on. Like, he's beating me for his truck getting dirty, and I don't even understand what just happened. Yeah. And then he leaves me, like, in the field to just finish, like, to move the water lines at the farm. And I'm just, like, he basically, he just throws my shirt out after he, like, wipes everything up. And he's just, and I'm just out in the field, like, what the fuck just happened? And I got beat for it, so I I didn't know anything, and I'm totally blaming myself, and I'm not realizing, at the time, I didn't realize, but, like, when he was asking questions, like, do you ever play with yourself? 
I was taking it like a child would. Like, mm. yeah, I play Legos. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because you have no concept or sex education at this point, right? You're only 14. Yeah, 14 is when that happened. And no, there's never been any kind of sex ed mm -hmm. education on that. Yeah, so it was kind of similar to where... You know how you guys have to, like, tell the bishop yeah. what your, like, masturbation stories. It was kind of like that, but at, a, like, a way, way extreme level. Yeah. Wow. I'm so sorry that you went through that. That's not okay. And I hope you've been able to do some healing since then because that, you know, it sticks with you. And, oh, yeah, that's a lot. So how were you feeling after all of this? This was the first time he had sexually abused you, but he had been abusive to you in the past. Did you kind of distance yourself from him? What what were what were things like after that happened? I didn't realize it at the time, but I wonder if that's why I was pulled out of school. So because at the time they didn't have so they didn't have a public high school or a private high school. So I would have had to go to public school. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I wasn't allowed to go to school was just to keep that a secret. Oh, wow. So other people knew about this? Your mom knew about this? My mom didn't know, but she knew something. I didn't even tell anyone except that's not true. I told one of the wives ish. And she told me that if he did something, she didn't really listen to me. She took it as a, um, uh, as he was uh, like disciplining me. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think she understood and I didn't know how to explain. Yeah. And she says, if he did something, he did it for a reason and you need to stop finding fault with the one above. Mm. And so I didn't really say anything. Luckily I did have my mom because I was like, she just noticed that I did not want to go to the cattle ranch. I would not go. Like, I fought her, and she's like, I don't know what happened, but I'm not making him go. And she she got some backlash for that. She Daniel didn't appreciate the way that she, he, she wouldn't just make us do whatever he told us, told us to do. Yeah. But and a lot of my experiences of my father, of memories of him, are my mom rescuing me from him. Mm. <laughs> and... If she wasn't around, he would beat you until you bleed or until you're like, you know, like you're crying and you're getting snotty. And then I don't think he stopped because you're snotty or bleeding. I think he stopped because he didn't want to get blood on his shirt. Like oh. he was just that kind of, I know, I know this is like really dark. No, I, it's I'm okay. I'm smiling and I can't help it. <laughs> it's okay. And you know what? Also, we've we've had people comment on stuff like that and I always say trauma emerges in its own way and sometimes we laugh and sometimes we cry and sometimes we yell and and the way that people process it and handle it is going to be completely different based on each individual person so I would never judge the way that <clears throat> you're telling a story or things are coming out or maybe you do feel like you're in a totally different place now and that's amazing too and so Never apologize for that because your process is your process and the way that you want to express your story is completely up to you. Yeah, honestly, I'm just glad. I think um, the only reason I'm able to talk about it now and the only reason I haven't talked about it before was because I just didn't want him in my life. I didn't. I just wanted to be done with it. But I'm yeah. actually at a place now that it's like, you know, other people, I probably have a brother. If one brother watches this, or one si sister watches this, it's still there. And it helps them to like, be like, oh, that's not normal. Yeah. Then, and I don't think you need to be brave enough to admit it. Like by the time I reported it, I went to like Brigham City. Um, I think I went and met an officer to report it in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then there was a statute of limitations and it was up because it like happened in like 2002. Oh. And it was just like touching and it didn't. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it's okay because I just wasn't there yet. I wasn't ready to address any of that stuff. Yeah. And that's okay. It takes time. It definitely takes time. I can completely understand that. So I'd like to understand more your relationship with the other wives, if any, because you said you did briefly 
kind of try to open up to one of them. So were you in contact with them? Did you guys ever meet up? Did you live in close proximity? Yes, the one I told about it, she was at the ranch that year for the summer. And she had been a babysitter while I was growing up. Actually, a funny story. I remembered uh, there was one time all of our half-siblings, we were little. And this is before they had their private schools. So everything was a secret. They didn't even tell who your moms were or whatever. So I heard like some of my, I thought my friends, but they're all my half brothers, right? They're like, oh, how many moms do you have? And everyone was saying they have multiple moms. And so they get to me and I don't even know because we're so sheltered. I didn't even know that like uh, my mom was a polygamist. (laughs) So, So I was like, I have two. One's name mom and one's name aunt so and so. Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't, I was just trying to fit in. But when I said two, then that mom, she was like, she's the one that asked me, she's like, who's your two moms? And that's when I answer her. To answer the question, there was relationships there, but it wasn't like how FLDS has um, mother so and so. Like, these are just other moms. Other families. And sometimes we're close, but it's more because of their kids, like our my best friends. So okay, so in because you are inserted into regular society or or normal society, I guess you could call it. You you're not living together in like one concentrated area. People have homes in different places, right? So right, were you close to them at all in proximity? Yeah, somewhat close. Proximity wise, um, there was me personally, no, but there was one street that had like four of my dad's wives Mm -hmm. on that street. And that's where we all got babysat and basically would just run across, you know, the whole freaking street. Yeah. (laughs) Did the other wives have as many children as your mom? Yeah. Actually, my mom got in trouble for not having um, them faster. (gasps) A few of her pregnancies that are four years apart. Yeah, so my dad, I guess I'll say my dad because fuck it. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. (laughs) So my dad told her, um, you know, at the cattle ranch, if a calf, if a cow doesn't have a calf after two years, we slaughter her. Like implying that she needs to have a child already. So your mom was feeling the pressure. The other wives definitely have as many kids as they can. I know you said you lost count after 163. What's the biggest number of children from one wife that you were aware of? That I'm aware of is 15. My goodness. That I can't even imagine. That's wow. I think about that a lot because I'm like, my mom, she wasn't like, we don't get through childhood for without getting scarred. Any of us, any of the viewers out there, we, we just don't. But I, like, have a lot of compassion for my mom because at my age, she had, what, nine kids? I'm like, oh, God. (laughs) Wow. How old are you now? Uh, 35. So at 35, she had nine children already. Maybe more. Who knows? I can't. I think it was 35, yeah. So we've covered the family dynamic. I'd like to get into you specifically growing up, how you were feeling and how you were processing being gay but not really understanding what that meant or what you thought it meant. Right. So... What I thought it meant, because in the church, and the Mormon church preaches kind of the same thing. It's like, it's a choice, Mm -hmm. and you just don't make that choice, right? So because it was a choice, in my head, I was like, okay, so everyone has these urges, and they just choose not to act on them. They tell you you can lose your place in heaven by your actions, right? Mm -hmm. So if you even act on your gayness once, right? You go, like, you're damned. Mm. <laughs> so, in my mind, I actually feel really bad for this, that, because, oh my gosh, I don't know if I should say this, but I think it's funny, so I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered your shirt that said, I'm sorry for what I said when I was in a cult. Yeah, I'm so excited that you ordered that. <laughs> yeah, and it's super fucking cute, and I, I wish I could have had it for this interview, but it, yeah, but anyways... Next time. Next time. But um, I had a sister, right? And she came to me and she was like, what happens if I have gay friends? Are they really going to go to hell? And I'm like, yep. Mm. And then she got married. And I don't think she likes men. 
So sad. Oh, so she was kind of trying to open up to you or test the waters and see what you f- how you felt about it. <clears throat> and you feel like she is actually gay as well and married a, ma- a man? Yes, and I kind of blame myself for pushing her to that because I don't think she's interested in men. Well, I'm, I know it's hard and it's easier said than done to say don't blame yourself. But really, at the end of the day, she made her own choices. So I would hope that you feel okay with that. I was the oldest and I brainwashed her. <laughs> No, you can't you can't blame yourself for that. I mean, you were raising a lot of your siblings and that's a lot. No child should have to do that to begin with. And you are yourself isolated within this community and your reality is this group and the rules are the only thing that you know and you're just we all do the best that we can with the information that we have unless of course you're a psychopath, but you know what I mean? Yeah. We do our best with what we're given. And so that's why I wanted to make that shirt. I'm sorry for what I said when I was in a cult because we've all done it. We've all said stupid, cringy things. And it's just like, I just, I thought I was right at the time. And you didn't purposely try to mislead her. You weren't doing it to be mean. You really were just giving her the information that you had at the time. Yeah. So thank you for that shirt. Cause that's going to, f- that, that actually helps me. Cause I know, <laughs> I know it was just that, but <laughs> yeah, that does it. You know, she's still living that lifestyle and it is her choice now. And she wants to be there and she doesn't want me in her life because mm-hmm. I'm an outsider and I respect that. That's fine. Yeah. So you're dealing with these feelings and you're thinking that everyone else is going through the same thing. At what point did you realize that wasn't the case? I was slow to learn that. I was slow to learn that. When I basically gave up, Chanel, the one that was on Escaping Polygamy, she was being abused by her husband, right? Mm. And my mom and I basically rescued her from that situation, got him, got her away from her husband. And then Daniel says, Chanel needs to go back to her husband or leave the order. And I, I was like, what the heck? How is this right? Because he would... I'm I'm just going to go there. He would choke her, and then she would pass out, and he went to work. He didn't wait wait to see if she was still alive. Like, Oh, no. He just went to work. Oh, I don't know. I'll let her tell some of her stuff. (laughs) Yeah, maybe we can have her on at some point. That would be awesome. Yeah, so I was late. The only reason I even learned anything was because I started dating outside people, and the reason I started dating outside people was because I was losing faith in everything. Okay. And we'll come back to that. I also wanted to touch on how you were, I don't know if trying to date is the right thing. You were courting women within the order with the intention of marriage because that's how it works, right? So can you speak to that a little bit? What I guess dating was like within the order? Yeah. um, So in the order... They have a a system where these women have choices and from a young age, your whole purpose in this culture is to find your number one choice that God wants you to marry because that person is going to take you to heaven. So first you get direction from God or is it a wet dream? I don't know. (laughs) But anyways. (laughs) Okay. So then you have direction and um, after that, you take your direction to your father. You tell him, hey, I had a wet dream. And then he says, <laughs> <laughs> about who? <laughs> Maybe pray about it more. Maybe it wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> so the system is you go to the dad. If your dad says it's cool, then you can go to the leader. And if he says it's good, then you can go to the girl's dad. And if the girl's dad says it's okay, you can present yourself as a marriage option. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I don't lose anyone. (laughs) No, I'm with you. Yeah, that's a process. And I did that five times. (laughs) Okay. At this point then, you were 100% on the path. You were ignoring your feelings and just saying, well, I have to marry a woman. Actually, you, you talked a little bit off camera about your plans to marry a woman and how you thought that those feelings would just go away. Do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I, I knew I wasn't attracted to women. I just thought that that attraction would come with marriage. Okay. And I would just get a, become attracted because I'm supposed to be and God would help me. 
Right. And it reminds me, have you seen the Book of Mormon <laughs> play? Um, uh, no, I haven't. I heard about it, though. Because there is a song in there. You could just Google it or type it in on YouTube, the Light Switch song. I think it's talking about missionaries and if they're gay, it's like, just turn it up like a light switch. <laughs> like just don't be gay yeah because that's how it works oh my gosh i want to rewind on this topic for a second yeah yeah so when i was getting kicked out then my dad was telling me hey you know we can fix this part right like the gay part okay conversion therapy type shit and i was like no thank you like at this point i was already dating outsiders and i was already had a boyfriend and i was just like no thank you <laughs> Yeah. So that is that why they kicked you out is because they found out you were gay? Ish. Like I they kicked me out because I wouldn't listen to Daniel after he found out I was gay. <laughs> okay. Cuz he would have Daniel would have let me stay had I just done whatever cuz he had ways to fix this, right? And I was like, "Fuck you." Well, I'm glad that you were in that headspace. I'm glad that you were already exposed to the outside world enough to know that that wasn't the right path for you. Me too. <laughs> and so speaking of marriage, I know that there are some pretty extreme marriages going on. I mean, your, your Daniel has 14 wives. That's, that's a lot. It's a lot of wives for any man to handle. I think one is enough for most. So when it comes to needing to get married, how young are women approached and how young are men kind of pushed to present themselves? Oh my gosh, this just, um, it's kind of disgusting when I explain it the way it's there. It is in their culture, right? A girl at eight years old will get a marriage, uh, a dance card. And these are the guys that she's supposed to pray about. And so whoever's asking her to dance when she's eight years old is who she's going to write as her possible options. And she's going to pray about this. And then it's going to get in her head and she's going to have a dream. And she's going to marry one of these motherfuckers. Val, eight years old? But the guys aren't allowed to go forward until, I mean, the youngest marriage I've heard of is 14. Okay. But that's still way too young. But yeah, that's still way too young. So at eight, year, eight years old, I'm trying to comprehend myself when I was eight years old and my mentality, it's just, that's a lot. They're literally grooming the girls to become wives and to pick a husband as soon as possible. And that's really terrifying, especially when, like you were saying, there's no sex ed. And so they don't really know anything. Yeah, I'm glad you said the word grooming because that's what it is. Yeah. And so for the men, do they start pushing you around 14 as well to do this? Well, with the men, I feel like with marriage, they just, it's like so indoctrinated that that's your purpose yeah. is to get married and have kids. So I don't know when it starts. I remember praying about who I was supposed to marry at five. Are you serious? Okay. So there's no limit here. <laughs> at least no. in mainstream Mormonism, it starts at 12, usually. It's like, okay, oh, wow. you're, a, you're a young woman now, and you go to young women's, the whole class, just for girls, and then you learn how to be a good wife and mom. But, yeah, even 12, obviously, is way too young. I remember they gave us this special hanger that was like, you, we would wrap it in yarn, and then there was a little poem that was like, I'm going to hang my baptism dress on this and then I'm going to hang my wedding dress on this. And it was just like, why are we doing this at 12? Anyway, since we're talking about the Mormon part and the gay part, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to bring up something that I actually am glad that I came out in Utah where Mormon, like all the other gays in this fucking state understand because they there's a lot of fucking Mormons. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that's really nice is I can say it was a cult, you guys. It was all a lie. <laughs> I don't know how you had to, Some people don't know this. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that experience at all as far as what it was like when you started dabbling in the outside world and started getting new perspectives and meeting new people? Yeah. So uh, the very first date I went on, I put it on Plenty of Fish. I don't know if anyone remembers Plenty of Fish, uh -huh. but... I made two profiles, a straight one and a gay one. And I was like, okay, God, whatever you want, 
make it happen. Okay. Because <laughs> I give up on the order. <laughs> and what happened? As you imagine, guys are easier to get a hold of. <laughs> really? <laughs> I didn't know. I can open my phone and get a guy over here in five minutes. Okay. Women are a little bit harder to crack. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. What was your first date like with a guy? So it was really nice. He was um, 19 and we went, uh, I met him at like, just like a hamburger joint. And then I, he invited me to go over to his grandma's house. He lived at his grandma, grandma's house. And I was telling him about my, my whole life. And in fact, my whole brain set when we went on this date was just like, you know, my cult was a, a lie and I'm ready to be corrupt because the the order tells you that um everyone on the outside does drugs they smoke yeah they all all they care about is sex and all this stuff and then so I was like okay will you teach me how to make out like basically the first thing I say to this guy yeah <laughs> and he did <laughs> oh that was probably really endearing he's like oh let me show you the world I don't know. Actually, I I thought it was different because that was literally my first kiss. Because we have order standards. I got ABC order standards. Uh -huh. And K is for kiss. Your first kiss is on your wedding day with your husband or wife. And here's my ABC order standards. Uh huh. Because I, I, I'm a good order member and I keep the order standards. <laughs> Just kidding. So your first kiss, how old were you when you went on that date? Either 21 or 22. So I was pretty late in the dating scene. Yeah. Okay. And so it went well. This guy, was he just like, wow, that's a lot of information when you were telling him about your cult upbringing? I actually was mostly telling his grandma about it. Oh. She was going to ask questions about it. Oh. <laughs> so. That's really sweet, actually. Yeah. Yeah, his grandma was asking questions about that. And I was just like answering normal questions in my mind. And she's just like, you know, that's not normal, right? Like, you don't have to ask to get your money. And I'm like, you don't? Right. What are you talking about? <laughs> Which is a funny story, like, side, side, whatever. I went to the bank one time, and I was, like, withdrawing a huge amount of money from just, like, a bank account, right? And I'm, like, telling this the tiller what it's for. And she's looking at me like, why the fuck are you telling me this? Uh -huh. And I was like, I don't have to tell you what it's for? And she's like, no. Oh. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really sweet. Were there any other moments like that, real world moments where you're just learning things for the first time and you're like, oh, that's not how life is? So many, so many. I can all, I can tell you the very last one I had because I had an aunt that finally like put things in perspective for me uh -huh. in the order. We're supposed to, at the dance, make sure everyone's having a good time. So like if a girl is like not dancing, then I'm supposed to go dance with her okay. and make sure she has fun. That's nice. So at the gay club, I was doing the same thing. I would find the creeps in the corner that didn't want to dance. <laughs> or that would look like they were having a bad time. <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> One of them put his hands down my pants, and I was like, is this normal? Oh, Like, no. what the fuck? And then everyone is like, nobody cared, so I just kept dancing. I was like, I guess it's normal. <laughs> right. Okay, so this is a perfect example, a tangible example, because we talk about this all the time, the purity culture thing, and how when you're taught abstinence only, you don't understand boundaries, and you don't understand that you can have boundaries in certain places and this is okay, but this isn't. It's, it's just kind of like an all or nothing situation. And so that perfectly illustrates when you don't, like you're supposed to save your first kiss for marriage. Right. You don't know what's okay and what's not okay when you choose to not do that. Then I was telling my aunt about it after, because this is after I left. This is like, I was already out of the cult when this happened, <laughs> but I still didn't know anything. And... Um, my aunt was like, if you have to ask if it's normal, it's not normal. Mm. And I was like, bittersweet with that information. Because I like those innocent eyes with the whole new world. Like, I was just like out in this whole new world. I delete everything I knew. And just now everything. Now I'm cynical as hell because <laughs> of that information. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's really helpful when you have people such as Amanda who you can talk to and be like, hey, help me out here. 
how do I get a normal bank account? How do I get a normal job? How do relationships work? Like, what is dating? Teach me how to go on a first date. So if you have any advice for someone who maybe is still in the order or in a group similar, what would your advice be to them? I don't know. Like, they don't listen anyways. (laughs) Okay, but if they were ready, if they were like, Val, I'm here with you. I I hear your story. Yes, I'm ready. I want to leave, but I'm too scared. I don't really know what to do first. What's your advice to them? There's, there's, I would tell them, I'm not a professional. Um, There's HOH, it's holding out help. They can help you. They helped me change my name. They helped me get out of that situation and they can help you too. That's great advice. That's all we needed. A resource, a great resource. Holding out help. We'll put it in the description below. Was there anything else that we haven't covered that you wanted to talk about? Okay. I wanted to mention one other thing. Because I was claiming the kids and they were basically, I raised them as my kids. Like, I actually had check stubs. And I saved this one because I was really upset. I paid so much child support that I had zero dollars. Wait, you paid child support? Yeah, I don't even have kids. Why did you pay child support? How did that happen? They told me it was so that I could claim them on taxes, which on the tax return, I didn't even get to keep that. That went to them too. Whoa. Okay, so we have... Okay, so cheating the system, basically. That actually reminds me. In Amanda's video, you had mentioned that your mom was too afraid to collect food stamps because she didn't want the government to find out that she was in a polygamous relationship. So that took a huge toll on your family and even just finding food was a really difficult experience. Do you want to talk about that at all? I mean, for us, it might have not been that difficult compared to some because we live next to a pig farm and this pig farm would get like old produce from Smith's. Um, There was like a hostess factory that was nearby. So they would get like literally there was like across the street from my house was a mountain of Twinkies and Ding Dongs and Ho-Hos, and we had literal snowball fights. Oh my gosh, snowballs. So you relied on dumpster diving then for your food, aside from what you were making at the store. I was like the lunch lady. I cooked for um, their elementary school. Mm. So when I first started, I was 16 working there, and there was like 430 students. By the time I left, five years later, there was like 700 and 35 students that I was making food for. Was this a public school or the private order school? Their private order school. So were you able to bring food home from your job? By the time I worked there, my mom actually did get food stamps. Okay. I was like, well, the last, by the time I got to the point of being the manager in that situation, <laughs> then she was already on food stamps. And I that's why I stayed for so long too. Even after I was already dating, I felt like, that a lot of these kids, this is the only meal they get. So I couldn't justify leaving because I knew that other previous cooks wouldn't even eat the food. And I had one rule, and that was, if I won't eat it, I'm not serving it. Because mm. they did get a lot of things from the dumpster. At the school? That they would use at, at the, the school. school? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so we touched on that, and I want... I- kind of derailed us, but we were talking about using government funds and kind of tricking the system in order to get money that you never saw, which meant claiming your siblings, basically adopting them as your own children. So you had to pay child support. I'm trying to wrap my brain around this. That's that's a lot. Are they still technically under your care? No, we never illegally adopted. It wasn't even like illegal child support. It was just within their system. On my statement, it said, it read child support. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I'm I'm following now. So this was just something within the order that they just used as an excuse to take your money. Down to zero. Got it. I'm following now. I'm following. Okay. Wow, that's really shitty. Yeah. Yeah. So you, when you got kicked out, they drained your account and you had no money? No, because I had receipts. What? <laughs> what do you mean? I left with paperwork. Okay. So I had my inventory list and I went to the leader 
And I was like, I'm not leaving because Daniel tells me to leave. He decided that I'm doing that bad things. Who said? He said? Uh-huh. <laughs> so I basically, I got my money. Good. I left with $9,000. In fact, okay. they made me, eventually, the leader got really mad at me because um, I showed up there with the cops. But really, why I showed up with the cops was I was, like, trying to get my money for, like, freaking two months or something like that after I already being kicked out. And they kept giving me the runaround. And so I was just, like, and then my mom calls me. And she's still in the order at this time. And she tells me, Daniel's asking if I, if you owe me anything at all. And it's like basically saying if she just has to say the word and anything that's in my account is hers. And she, and I was like, why are they still talking to him? I had to like jump hoops to be like tied to my grandpa because my dad kicked me out of the family. So I was like, I can't, I had meetings with the leader brother Paul to be like, I need to tie to God and play your stupid game. And I don't have anyone to tie to because my dad kicked me out of the family. So I'll just tie to my grandpa and stay here and get so, but because I'm in grandpa's family, let's get all my money out of Daniel's family's account and put it in grandpa's family's account. Uh -huh. And that was easier to get my money. Yeah. I guess. I know I'm probably going on a rant. This probably makes no sense to anyone because <laughs> that is all gibberish. Like, their whole system is gibberish. It's garbage. But I had to play their game, played by their rules, and then I got kicked out because I showed up with the cops because I didn't ever want to see Daniel ever again. I had already decided I never want to see him ever again, and I just brought the cops there to, like, kind of keep Daniel away from me. Okay. But Paul met us at the door, and he's like, whoa, why are you bringing, why are you bringing cops? And then he basically had me sign this thing that said, I request my membership in the Davis County Cooperation Society to be discontinued. I understand by withdrawing my savings, my account will be closed. I have agreed to sign away... Like, basically, I have no claims to any funds or property of any kind from the Davis County Co-op or any of its affiliates. Okay. I'm thrilled that you walked out of there with $9,000. That's amazing. I know. It was like the best day of my life. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So how are you doing now? What is the consciousness side of your story? What makes you happy? I know you got a YouTube channel. You're doing things now. So talk about that. Okay, I'll talk about that a little bit. So on my YouTube channel, I just want to do, like, I want to bring self-awareness and love and, and healing. And I don't know how I'm going to do it exactly, but I have a lot of big ideas. <laughs> yeah, you just started. Yeah, I just started. And the last video I did was um, how people get brainwashed in a cult. And that's my view on it. And I tried to be more healing about it. And you guys should go check it out. But I also wanted to give a shout out to my Aunt Kathy. I don't know if anyone's ever seen Escaping Polygamy. She was in Escaping Polygamy. And she makes hand soap, right? So I'm actually going to put together like a treat yourself box. Because my whole point is to like, to love yourself. So I got, I'm obsessed with magnets. So I get a box that has a magnet in, right? And we're going to put, this is my logo for Awesome. Oh, soap. <laughs> And then my Aunt Kathy makes these soaps, and she's getting the money for this. And I'm experimenting. Right now we're just in pro like product testing mode. Me and my husband made um, candles. We're just testing them oh, out. Wow. I don't know if you can see the glitter. That's awesome. But they smell nice. My goal is uh, in November I would have my boxes ready to sell on my store. How fun. You'll have to let us know when you get that up and running. So, guys, if you want to check that out, his at is at valiant.unicorn. I'll put his link in the description below, and I'll put a link to his first video as well. And is there anything else you want to share? I mean, you're married. That's amazing. Congrats. It seems like you're doing well, and it seems like you're happy and thriving. Yeah. I mean, I just don't have time to be sad. So, all right, that's amazing. Well, hold on, one more thing. Yeah. Oh wait, we're not leaving. I forgot. You still got to listen. 
Did you want to say something else before we do the Linda Listen? No. Okay. He's, Go ahead. He's ready for the Linda Listen. <laughs> do you have one ready for me? Your sassy statement or your inspirational statement? Yeah, I have an inspirational statement because we don't care about the stupid people anymore. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear it. All right. Linda Listen. You're a goddamn unicorn. Yes. Is that it? I love it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Put it on a t-shirt for your merch. <laughs> I should... <laughs> I think we might have to add that to the store. I think you guys go to the store and check if it's available by the time this airs because I love that unicorns are my favorite. My wedding cake was a unicorn with butterfly um, mane. That is amazing. Please send me a picture of that. (laughs) Okay, so guys, if you want to follow Val, obviously go to his YouTube channel, which we will link below. His Instagram is at snow.val if you want to get in touch with him and yeah go check out see what he's doing over on his brand new youtube i know you have some cooking videos up right now and then you have the culty stuff and i just love that you're promoting self-love and creativity and thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story yeah you're welcome anytime Celise. thanks yeah So, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I would love it if you could support the channel even just by liking, sharing the video, and commenting down below some words of encouragement and or some unicorn emojis. (laughs) And if you want to check out our brand new merch that just dropped like three days ago, we're going to try and add that unicorn shirt as well. So, you can find that at cultstoconsciousness.com. YouTube won't let me put up all of the, I call it the After Dark merch that didn't pass the YouTube YouTube checks. So you can find that on our website. And if you want to become a patron, you can do that too. Patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Our newest patrons, Alana, Winnie, and Antonia. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you like this video, I'll put some videos down below that you'll want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. <laughs>